Hear the word of the Lord from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 2. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We are not looking for praise from people, nor from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we, are like, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, friends of Jesus, today is technically the last day on which I am here in the pulpit as the, for, my formal role as the pastor of Fairlawn CRC. Now, I know that sounds a little bit odd because you know that I'm still preaching for the next couple of weeks and I'm here around and living in the parsonage and all of those things, but uh, I officially start tomorrow as the Christian Reformed Church's Director of Ecclesiastical Governance, and I will be working at that job remotely for a couple of weeks while we wrap up some things here. And as I thought about that transition, and I sat in my office this week and this last week in which Fairlawn is my primary focus and responsibility, I got to thinking about how would I summarize what God has been doing here in the last number of years. Now, of course, I've known that this day was coming for a while, or at least I knew that it might come. I mean, I went through the application process and things like that. And so I've had time to think about this for a little bit. And as I thought about the kinds of things that I might say on this day, whenever it came, this passage from Thessalonians caught my attention, especially the first verse. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. Now, I realize seven years is a little bit more than just a visit. I mean, if somebody came to your house and stayed seven years, you'd probably say, that's not a visit. They actually moved in. So it's not quite exactly what Paul is talking about here. But the, the phrase and the idea behind it, I think, captures a question that's really important for us to ask about any season of ministry that we're involved in personally or that our church is going through. The question is this, what exactly has God been up to? Now, I want to highlight right away that there could be a defensive way to ask this question if you read Paul a certain way. You know, well, you know we, didn't, we didn't do everything wrong. And, and you kind of catch a little bit of that in, in Paul. You know, well, you know, you, you know how we lived and you know how we did everything. And I think for any of us, when we ask that question of, you know, what has God been up to, there is that urge to kind of be defensive. But that's not the tone that I think Paul captures this morning. It's not the tone, certainly, that we want to have, that I want to have. But rather, I think that this question captures something of the humility and the honesty that each of us ought to have before God and that our churches ought to have before God. As we think about what God has been up to and what we've been doing with that over the last whatever period of time we're talking about. And so I got to wondering this morning, or as I thought about this passage, I got to wondering, why would Paul feel the need to even ask that question? What might have been, why would he think that his ministry there might have been without result, or that people would see it as without result? What does his comment say about the work of the church in a particular context, and about the expectations we have for its ministry? 
Well, I think in order to understand Paul's comments and his question here, we need to go back to his, the story of his visit to Thessalonica, which is told in Acts chapter 17. And if you've got your Bibles open, you can kind of look at it and scan through it. You'll see there that Paul was able to have only a, a short ministry there. The Bible mentions three weeks of preaching. Now, it doesn't mean that he only stayed for three weeks, but he didn't have a very long period there that, that he, was, he was ministering. And if you re keep reading in Acts 17, you see that what happened at the end of his ministry is that there was a riot, and he had to basically flee for his life. And while a couple of his close associates might have been able to stay for a little while longer, things didn't work out the way that Paul might have hoped, that you know, he could have handed things off there with kind of an intentional transition. And given how his ministry has ended, and he, we heard earlier how he was treated outrageously in Philippi, which is a city, you know, another day, day or a couple days journey down the road, coming off of both of those experiences, we can see why Paul might say, what was the point of all of that? What did it really accomplish? Now, I think it's actually a healthy practice for churches and church leaders to reflect periodically on what exactly God has been doing around them. And I'm thankful to say that here at Fairlawn, I don't feel like I've been persecuted or that I've got mobs coming after me and I have to leave kind of, you know, fleeing for my life or anything like that. This is a good place. It's a place that has been good for, for, for ministry, for our family. But I think we can all be honest sometimes, too, about any season of church life and say, how are things going? What were our expectations? And I think we can all look at seven years of, of church history or 20 years or however long you've been here and say to yourself, you know, Fairlawn isn't as large as it used to be. And, and the, the people who are here are, are, are older than we used to be. We don't have as many young families as we used to have. We can all acknowledge, I think, those of us who were here seven years ago, myself included, that we thought that having a pastor with a young family would be a catalyst for other young families to begin worshiping here. And some of those things didn't happen. We can look at our attempts to connect with our neighbors, outreach programs that we've had, or maybe personal invitations that we've extended, people that we've invested in that maybe we didn't know, but God just brought across our path. And maybe we had hoped that those would result in some some deeper connections, and that hasn't happened. Maybe we've had personal expectations about what church life should be. We, we hoped for more robust discussions about certain kinds of issues, or maybe we, we wished that the discussions that we had didn't have to happen. Maybe we had hoped that Fairlawn would take a firmer stance on certain kinds of moral and social commitments, and, or maybe we wished that the church would be more flexible on some of these kinds of things. Maybe you longed for richer community, and you're disappointed that it just didn't happen. Or maybe you're disappointed that as you're getting older, you find that you just don't have the energy that you would like to have in order to invest in the life of the church. And I share these things, again, not because we want to come up with a list of all the things that we are doing wrong, but to recognize that we all have expectations for what church life should be and how it should happen. And I, as a pastor, can think about conversations that I've had over the course of my ministry here and in New Jersey, and I think about some of those conversations, and I wish they had turned out differently. Sometimes I wish that people had responded more to my, my encouragement or my, my challenges. Sometimes I look back on the conversations and I say, yeah, you know, maybe there's things I could have said or done differently. But I think the confidence that we have in all of the ministry that we do is that God is involved in it. And if we are genuinely seeking his will and his grace in our lives as individuals and as a church, then we don't have to throw up our hands every time something doesn't go the way that it does, that, that we, uh, you know, in a way that we, we, do, we wish it had gone otherwise. Even when our sinful self gets in the way, because sometimes that's what plays into our expectations. My expectations sometimes are built on my own hopes and dreams rather than on the things of the Lord. <clears throat> The measure of our worth as a church, the measure of our worth as individuals in God's sight, is not in the fact that we have done everything right. It's not in the fact that everything has gone exactly the way that we wanted with the circumstances around us. Paul is getting chased out of Thessalonica. Again, could he have said, I don't know, maybe I should have you know, engaged the, the culture differently. Maybe if I would have said some things or been more careful or less inflammatory, maybe they wouldn't have come chased me out of town. 
And we don't know what Paul is thinking. But certainly things aren't going the way that he would have liked. But our faith is not in our accomplishments, but in what God, our need for God, <clears throat> our need for the grace that we receive from Christ and from each other. And that is Paul's point in this section. He observes that the work of the gospel in the Thessalonian church is not about entertaining people. It's not about making them feel good about themselves. It's certainly not, he says, about financial gain for himself or anyone else. The goal of the church in Thessalonica was not to get a pat on the back from the world around it. It's saying, you know what, well, we don't agree with you on everything, and we're going to go keep worshiping Zeus. You guys are doing good. <clears throat> no, Paul says, what our ministry was about was about the family of God. It's about living in the wonder that God would call us to be his children in Jesus Christ. And he shares a metaphor, he shares a picture of the church there. Two ways, actually, two different times. First, he says in verse 7, we were like a mother caring for her little children. And he says in verse 11, we were like a father dealing with his own children. We think about measuring the results of any ministry season. Paul says one of the things that we're doing is really looking at measuring how we build a family. Or maybe we could put it this way. The church aims to build a culture, not an institution. And sometimes that's a lot harder to measure. Because the mission of Fairlawn is not to design a worship service that moves our emotions, whatever that would mean for us individually. And we're going to have a variety of opinions of that here. The mission of Farallon is not the creation of a curriculum or an educational program that makes us experts at Bible trivia or that helps us to, to figure out the culture around us. The mission of the church does not lie in the programs that we coordinate to engage our neighbors, support missionaries overseas, or care for those less fortunate than ours. And certainly a church is not successful simply because our finances are such that we can keep the lights on from year to year. Now, all of those things are important parts of a church life. But what we want is not to focus on those things, but to see that those things are important because they help us live as a family, kind of like in our own family's life. Yes, we need the finances to make sure that we have heat in our house, but that's not the point of family life. We want church to be a place where we find joy in gathering together in worship just because we get to be together as children of God. We want church to be a place where we do learn to apply the Bible to our daily lives and to the issues of this world and to have hard conversations sometimes about what it means to unpack this issue or that in a, in a culture that, that is, is, going cra you know, is way different than it used to be even a few decades ago but to do so because we trust that the people with whom we're having that conversation are our brothers and our sisters in Christ. We want to be the place where cares for the poor and the environment and those who don't yet know Jesus as Lord, whether it's here in our own communities or in far-flung reaches of the globe. We want to be a place that is dedicated to the financial and volunteer needs of the church's ministry, but to do so because we are conscious of the fact that God has called us into his people. And we get to do this thing that we call church week in and week out. I was trying to think this week about what it's like to, to build a family culture. And some of you know that I love baseball. I mean, if you ask me, baseball is the greatest sport ever invented, at least before they came up with a universal designated hitter and the ghost runner in extra innings. But that's a whole other topic. You can ask me about that afterwards. But I love baseball. And if you had asked me, oh, about 16, 18 years ago, what my family life was going to look like, I would have said that, well, part of our family togetherness would be that we would be sitting down watching baseball games. And maybe I would be like catch in the backyard with the kids or, you know, give them fire points on, on how to field grounders. Well, I've gotten to do some coaching of my kids, but it's not on the baseball field. It's on the soccer field. Will did indulge me, his dad, for a little bit. He played one season of Little League and decided that wasn't really for him. It was boring, I think he said. And then the rest of the kids have all followed suit. 
Now, they've humored me on occasion by going to the Woo Sox from time to time and, and watching clips of the 2016 Cubs World Series Championship on YouTube, especially when they figure out that that can keep them up later at night and, you know, dad's distracted, so they, you know, get an extra 15 minutes before bedtime. But my vision for family togetherness wasn't exactly what theirs was. And that's okay. Because I've realized over time that if I try to force my vision and my love for baseball upon them, then I'll probably do two things. One, they won't really like baseball anymore. They'll resent it. And two, they'll resent the time that they have to spend with their dad. And I'd lose on both hands. And I think there's an analogy there for our approach to measuring ministry. What are we trying to measure? Well, the church is bigger than a family, and so we need programs for education and outreach, and we need budgets, and we need a philosophy of worship, and it's helpful to name the programs that we're running and count the people that are involved in them. But the aim of the church is not to count all of those things, but to develop a culture that makes us into the family of God and turns our eyes to the work of Jesus among us. And that's a harder thing to measure, like family togetherness. I mean, you don't measure your family togetherness by saying, well, we got the, everybody around the table 16 times this year. How do you measure family togetherness? The number of phone calls that you have with your children who live out of state? The number of times they come to visit you? The number of cards or emails or texts you get? Now, the aim of the church is harder to measure. How do you calculate your success as a parent? How do you gauge the impact of a thousand little things that you did over the course of some, a child's 18 years in your home? In the window in our kitchen, Brandy had a sign for a number of years that was a quote from Ann Voskamp, if you know her. And it went something like this, every day when you do the hard things you don't want to do, you're building the family you always wanted. And I think, though, it's hard to measure, <clears throat> measure results that way. In some ways, this is what the church is called to do. To do the little things, to do maybe the things that we don't always want to do for each other. But to do them conscious of the fact that those little things, the give and take of community life, is helping us build the kind of people to become the kind of people can see God working in us as a community and seeing God work in us as individuals. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He says, like a mother, God's people have the delight to share not just information, but light, life together in the Lord. And he says in verse 9, mothers often labor day and night to show their children what love looks like. And I think about the mothers in this room. And you know what it is to labor day and night. Mothers don't work when it's convenient. Well, sometimes they do, but most of the time they, they work because they're called upon to do so and because someone is demanding their attention. And that they do that in order to show the love that comes from being part of a family. Paul goes on to say in verse 12 that fathers, like a father, he encourages and comforts and urges kids to live in ways that reflect the family values. You think, well, what does that look like in a church? Well, as I think about the ministry that a church like Fairlawn has, what are the things that we've been trying to do over the years? Well, we've been trying to find ways to nurture each other's faith, to teach the ABCs, if it were, as, you, as it were, of, of faith in following Jesus. And of course, you know, as kids get a little bit older, not, I'm just, not just talking about kids now, but as we get a little older and mature in the faith, to teach some other things as well. It's the kind of investment that goes into teaching church school. It's also the same kind of investment that goes into coffee break or that goes into just the individual conversations that we have. What, what does the Bible say? What does it mean for us? Part of family life is bringing family together around the table. How do we do that in worship? How do we do that as we come together around the Lord's Supper? to point one another towards this, the death and resurrection of Jesus that is the hope and the nourishment of our faith. Families tell stories about who they are. 
Hey, you, you never remember, kids, what, what grandpa was like when he was little, what grandma was like when, when she was a teenager. You know what she did? And in the same way, churches tell stories. Some of those stories go way back. They go back to the Bible, to people like David, Ruth, Moses, and Mary and Joseph and the apostles. Some of them are more recent stories. Stories I've gotten to hear over the last couple of last number of years about people who helped build this church and who worked on it with their own hands and, and, and who, who wired it themselves. People who invested in the life of this community, people who continue to invest here. Discipline. You know, it's one thing to encourage. It's another thing to comfort, maybe a little bit harder sometimes. But to urge people to live urge kids, urge the people around us to live lives worthy of the Lord. That can be a harder thing, especially in a world that's telling us something different. And those conversations aren't always the formal ones that, that happen at the council level. More often, those are conversations that we have with each other as we rub shoulders with people in our own community and say to each other, what does it mean that God would have us live this way? Those are the kinds of things that matter as we take part in the family of Christ here at Fairlawn. And yes, we can measure some things. We can measure baptisms and membership transfers and professions of faith, and we can measure Sunday attendance. We can measure giving. But at some point, this becomes a matter of saying, what is God doing in the culture here? What's God doing in our hearts? What kind of people are we becoming? And does, that, does the kind of people we are becoming, not even necessarily the kind of people we are right now, but we are on that journey, what does that say? What does it reflect about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit? How has that changed over the years? You know, this morning we're installing new elders and deacons and we're thanking those who have served and it's a good time to ask, as you're coming off of council, what has God been doing through me, through us, in the last three years? What are we looking and praying for in the next three? And I think as good a goal as any is the, what we find in the last verse we read, verse 13. You received the word of God as the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. See, we can always find plenty of things this side of heaven that will be disappointing about the church. Even if we're really positive about the church, we can find one or two things that are like, ah, you know what, I wish this were different. Some of those disappointments may require repentance from all of us collectively. Some of them may require repentance from us individually in terms of our own expectations and sinful hopes that we had. But I think we can rejoice in the fact that we know God continues to work in us, whether quickly or slowly, but in ways that make his word, as we just sang, come alive in us and prompt us to believe more deeply in the forgiveness and new life won for us by his son, Jesus, at the cross. The word of God is here. And as we think about it, as we form our lives around it, we receive it as something that really comes from God, that we're really wrestling with before God. Because we believe in Jesus, his son. Now, like most of us, I'd love to offer a chart this morning, or maybe a pie graph, or some, you know, some percentages, or something like that, some metrics that said, you know what, this is how we can go back and say, hey, you know what, the last three years that you spent on council, or the years that you spent in leadership of one of the ministry teams, or one of the ministries here, that's how we know it was successful. A chart or a graph that would offer us measures that we know will me help us to see what the years to come should hold. But I think we all realize that there's no such grid. Instead, this morning, we hear God's invitation to reflect on the work he is doing here, the results of changed hearts, results of a changed culture, to be conscious of his mercy that shapes us into a community that gives us a sense of wonder that we get to be a part of God's family by grace. We're not called to build an institution, but we are called to build a culture, a culture that shapes hearts, shapes our hearts, 
that shapes the heart of this church, and then by extension, that shapes the hearts of those in community around us as they see Christ in us. Let's pray.